I'd like to introduce our speaker for today. Um, it's my real pleasure to introduce Rino Raffioli. Um, he's chief scientist and head of external R&D at GSK Vaccines um, in Siena in Italy. Um, he's also a professor of vaccines research at Imperial College in London. Um, Reno has received many prizes for his work, uh, most recently the 2019 Robert Koch Award. Um, he's introduced novel scientific concepts. Uh, many of you will be familiar with reverse vaccinology. Um, and he's also the founder of the GSK Vaccine for Global and So it gives me so much pleasure. Um, Rino, we thank you for taking the time to be with us. Um, and I'd like to hand over to you to tell us about COVID-19 vaccine. Thank you. Well, thank you, Faye. Uh, hi, everybody uh, in the webinar. Um, as you, as Faith said, I am chief scientist at GSK Vaccines. Uh, and today I will talk to you about uh, COVID vaccines. Uh, as an introduction, the presentation I'm making today uh, basically is about my personal views of vaccine development uh, <clears throat> for COVID and does not necessarily reflect the GSK uh, views on, on the vaccines. Uh, uh, the first thing I would like to start with a one slide introduction to our experience with emerging infectious diseases. As you can see in this slide, during the last uh, 20 years, uh, we saw many if emerging, many infectious diseases emerging. Starting from the bottom, you see SARS, then you see Ebola, then you see Zika, uh, pandemic influenza in 2009. And all of them were different viruses, different origin, different things. But they had something very, very important in common. They all uh, were absent at some point on the left. Then uh, they had the first case. And then at some point they started to have a peak of uh, intensity, different uh, intensity for different diseases. And then after the peak, they basically they decreased and went away. Uh, you see the yellow bar, that basically is the part that defines the peak of the, each of them. So different diseases, different, uh, different years, but similar pattern. They, they come and they have a peak of intensity and they go. Uh, in the next slide, I'll, show, I'll summarize what happens. Uh, and you see what happens is the bottom part of the slide. Basically, as soon as the first case happens, some points pick it up by the media uh, and start to make a lot of noise. Uh, in, and uh, with, a lot, with the noise of uh, political uh, engagement, basically at some point money becomes available. Uh, at that point, since there's a new infectious disease, there are no experts uh, about it. But as soon as the money becomes available, then people from academia, people from industry, people from biotech, they start to work on it. And they start to become experts. And they start to make some very fundamental work and they learn quickly. At some point, uh, there is a peak of... Uh, learning and a lot of activities, vaccines, diagnostics, drugs are being developed. But unfortunately, the peak comes just outside of the yellow bar, which is the intensity of the epidemic or pandemic. And then uh, the, basically, the, usually the epidemic ends for other reasons. Uh, then the money ends and then the project ends and basically, uh, we have never been prepared to face a pandemic or an epidemic or an emerging infectious disease. So basically, that's what we are seeing for SARS, Ebola, Zika, pandemic influenza. And uh, then when Ebola came, we basically the international community said, we, this cannot happen again because we are never prepared for emerging infectious diseases. So at some point, uh, the... CEPI was set up. 
CEPI is the Coalition uh, for uh, Pandemic Preparedness, and is basically they started to have uh, put together uh, approximately 700 million, basically to fight emerging infectious diseases and to prepare the world for them. And the they uh, basically started uh, funding uh, biotechs and academic labs, basically develop vaccines, and they prioritize uh, six targets. The MERS, LASA, NIPA, uh, Rift Valley, Chikungunya, and a disease X that was supposed to be something they didn't know about. So as you can see, they had one corona uh, uh, vaccine there, uh, but was MERS was not something was not known uh, like, like COVID at that time. And then uh, basically the unexpected came and COVID came. So what do we know about COVID and what can we do? I mean, the, I'll show you a little bit of what happened when SARS came, the first coronavirus uh, back in early, uh, in, in 2003, basically uh, 2002, 2003. At that time, uh, when the virus came, uh, the, it was uh, like a global emergency like now. And the, also at that time, we were able to contain the spread of the virus by quarantine and hygiene because we didn't have anything. At that time, we worked on that, on that and we were lucky because there was a, a person that stopped at the Frankfurt airport and was hospitalized so we could get the virus get the sequence of the virus done in five days and use the sequence of the virus uh, basically to do, uh, uh, to design and make a vaccine and to and use the, vi uh, basically the, make a recombinant proteins and make a vaccine. That vaccine was never used, never went to phase one because the, by the time we had the, the vaccine made, the SARS epidemic uh, had gone. Now, uh, but what we learned is basically how the SARS uh, genome was made and, and the S protein you see, uh, you see uh, indicated by an arrow, which is part of, in, in the genome. You could identify the, the gene which causes for the protein involved in the, uh, which causes for the protein, which is the major antigen for a vaccine. So that was the experience with SARS. And at that time, obviously, we was very important to have access to the virus uh, from a patient which was stopped at the Frankfurt airport. Uh, what's different today? Uh, today, uh, well, it's different that basically we don't need the virus because the, the, the sequence can come through the internet. In fact, the new ways of doing uh, vaccines, I think started in 2013. In 2013, around these uh, days, what happened was, again, the Chinese CDC reported uh, the appearance of an uh, influenza virus, H7N9, that was potentially a pandemic virus. And on the Easter day of 2013, they put the sequence of the hemagglutinin and neuraminidase into the website in the internet. That was Easter. At that time, I was collaborating with uh, Craig Venter uh, in San Diego. And on Monday, Easter, basically, we took the sequence and Craig Venter synthesized the two genes uh, <clears throat> in one day. And at the end of the day, he sent uh, through express mail the two genes to our laboratory in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And next day, we basically started to use the two genes. And in one week, we had an RNA-based vaccine ready to immunize mice. That was the first time that a, a vaccine was done to immunize animals in one week starting from the sequence and which did not require the, uh, the virus because the sequence was obtained from the internet. And at that time, 
we basically I can if I can go to the next slide. Uh, okay. <clears throat> At that time, we generated this uh, uh, this uh, slide and basically said, well, the world has changed. We don't need to s ship viruses anymore. It, we can ship sequences through the internet and uh, and basically uh, move and generate the, the synthetic gene on the other side uh, or, or any place in the world and basically make vaccines, synthetic vaccines made with that. In, <clears throat> And in the next slide, basically, we used the same sequence also to generate a viral seed for influenza. And that was done in five days. And basically, again, the idea was that in the modern times, you don't need to send viruses anymore. You can use the sequence, uh, whatever is, uh, regardless where it's generated, you put in the internet, that travels at the speed of light. And uh, at the same time, uh, in any, any other part of the world, you can use the, the sequence basically to generate a new, uh, to generate the vaccines. Next slide is going to uh, uh, shows basically that once you have a, the sequence, you can do uh, the uh, RNA vaccines, as explained before, in seven days. But in five days, you can actually splice your synthetic gene any, in any of the viral vectors that are used today to make vaccines. And you see on the right of this slide, many like alpha virus, VSV, uh, adenovirus, chimp adenovirus, pox virus, cytomegalovirus, and measles viruses. All these things, uh, can, all these viruses can be used replicating or replicating to make uh, as vectors to deliver our synthetic vaccines. So those two platforms are pretty, uh, easy to make uh, in the lab what, <coughs> using a synthetic gene. Next slide shows you the, the other platform you can use. You can you still use the synthetic gene to generate cell lines that will produce your recombinant protein. That takes a little bit longer at the beginning. And then once you have the protein, you purify and you can immunize animals. And uh, usually for a protein-based vaccine, you do need an adjuvant. And here in this slide, you see uh, on the left, uh, if you immunize without an adjuvant, and on the right, you see the advantage of having an adjuvant. So basically, having a synthetic gene, you can make three, uh, at least three types of vaccines, one based on RNA very quickly, one based on viral vectors, another one based on uh, protein-based vaccines, plus or minus adjuvant. Next slide, uh, basically tries to summarize what I just said. And basically, uh, there are three types of vaccines you can make. Well, the first one is RNA vaccines. I mean, these are the fastest to be developed. I show you that already in 2013, uh, <clears throat> we could make that in one week to immunize mice. Uh, and those RNAs uh, basically are, uh, in fact, the RNA-based vaccine has been the first one to reach uh, clinical trials uh, in Seattle a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so RNA vaccines are being developed, are being tested in humans, uh, and they're, uh, I'm pretty sure they will be immunogenic. Now, the problem with RNA vaccines is that there is no RNA-based vaccine license today. So is a a very uh, early platform is not mature. There have been a lot of uh, phase one and phase two trials, but still there are questions about efficacy, there are questions about safety, and even if the vaccine is safe and effective, uh, the question is we don't have yet on the industrial scale the quantity of the, the manufacturing scale to uh, manufacture uh, hundreds of millions of, of doses. So RNA vaccines are moving, they're fantastic. I'm sure will be part of the future in vaccinology, but still not very mature technology. Viral vectors, I mentioned the viral vectors before, uh, they are more mature, the Ebola vaccine is licensed as a, a viral vector. 
Uh, so we, there is already some capacity for manufacturing, but there is still there is only one uh, vaccine license. Some capacity is there. Uh, they can also be fast, but still is a, an emerging technology, not yet mature, not uh, present everywhere. <clears throat> and then there are traditional protein-based vaccines. As I said before, these are recombinant proteins plus or minus adjuvants, although I believe the adjuvants will be absolutely needed. And where the recombinant spike protein will be expressed is expressed in mammalian cells, uh, in baculovirus or plant cells, etc. I'm sure this, pro uh, this uh, type of technology will work, will generate very good uh, neutralizing antibodies. Uh, <clears throat> there will be a question, and and the question is for all three platforms is how we avoid a, a, ADE, which is antibody uh, dependent disease announcement. It's a question that needs to be addressed for all, all three. But when I look at the three platforms, basically the, the protein based, although it's slower to start, maybe the one that will be is the only platform from my point of view that if needed, will be able to deliver hundreds of millions of doses. The reason is that the, uh, basically, uh, we have a lot of experience with, with this uh, platform. Uh, we have capacity for manufacturing worldwide, and uh, we know about very well about the safety, immunogenicity. We know how to handle this thing. So these are the three platforms. Uh, then I have added the human monoclonal antibodies at the bottom because human monoclonal antibodies are extremely important, I believe, and fast to develop, and they're a complement to uh, vaccines. And today we are able to do them. In fact, for Ebola, they've been the first drug ever developed for Ebola was a human monoclonal antibody. I want to spend a couple of minutes on the human monoclonal antibodies in the next slide. Oh, sorry, I wanted to mention another thing. Once, whatever you do, platform you use, RNA, viral vectors, or protein-based, once you have done what has been done so far, basically to produce um, a vaccine that works in, in animals, basically you have done <clears throat> only 10% of the work. 90% uh, of the work still needs to be done. And, uh, and that's the difficult part because that part requires scaling up uh, of the technology, uh, testing, uh, making GMP manufacturing, industrialization, uh, phase one, phase two, phase three, uh, building a, or uh, reusing a, a manufacturing site and getting a license. So this process usually for normal vaccines takes 10, 15, sometimes 20 years. Now, and the investment is huge. While the, fir the, the first part uh, of uh, getting to 10% is pretty cheap, the investment to make a vaccine and bring it to the people is, is very large. Uh, and uh, the, as I said, usually it takes 15, 20 years. In case of emergency, uh, you can reduce the, speed, the, the time. In case of Ebola, we have been able to reduce to uh, five years. Uh, however, in, in the case of Ebola, we have also learned that we can further reduce with the new technologies, we can really reduce a lot. Uh, and today, if people ask how long it's going to take to make a vaccine for uh, COVID, I would say uh, probably we can improve over the Ebola, probably can do uh, in much shorter timelines. I would say minimum one year, uh, reasonably in 18 months. But between one and three years, we should have a vaccine produced in large scale available for people. In order to do that, the next slide shows some of the things that we need to do is basically uh, take the traditional vaccine development, which is uh, in, in the upper part of the, uh, uh, of the slide where it says 2015, and basically use all the technologies that we have today uh, to shorten the timelines. Basically, 
uh, <coughs> use all the system serology, all the uh, the uh, system vaccinology, the the, the different uh, manufacturing technology, and everything <coughs> basically to shorten the timelines, and uh, with the help of regulatory. Uh, uh, regulatory agencies basically to make a vaccine in, in 12, 18 months. So these things are possible thanks to the incredible use of technologies that we have today. Uh, next slide. Uh, just a couple of slides about human monoclonal antibodies. This first slide shows from the left to right that when we started making human monoclonal antibodies for HIV in the early 90s, we had a B12, which required several micrograms to neutralize the virus. Today, on the far right, you see VRC26, which is a thousand times more potent than the one that we had at that time. That means that the last 30 years, basically 25 years, we have improved enormously our ability to uh, find and, uh, uh, <clears throat> and manufacture very potent antibodies that can be used for prevention, for therapy and prevention. Indeed, in the next slide, uh, in the case of Ebola, as I just said before, the human monoclonal antibodies were developed faster than vaccines, and they've been the first drug developed for therapy and for prevention of uh, uh, Ebola. So I believe that also in the case of uh, COVID, uh, while we develop vaccines, we should also develop at the same time in parallel human monoclonal antibodies. Next slide. <clears throat> we are getting to the end. Uh, so this is my views about vaccines. What's going to be the future? Well, there are <clears throat> three possible scenarios. One is that with the summertime, COVID is going to go away and the autumn will find a new world and basically we forget about COVID. I don't think this is a scenario is uh, likely. We can hope for it, but I don't think that's what's going to happen. The second scenario is basically that COVID becomes pandemic or endemic, sorry, it's already pandemic, and we start to have a second waves of infection. And then hopefully when that comes, we will need, we will have some vaccines and possibly we'll have some drugs and monoclonals uh, that we will be able to handle the endemic COVID. There is a third scenario that COVID will start to mutate and by the time we have vaccines or drugs, uh, those will not be effective anymore uh, uh, against the COVID because it now has mutated, somehow similar to what happens to influenza. Now, I believe this third scenario for what we've seen so far about this virus is unlikely, at least doesn't seem to mutate at the speed that will make uh, vaccines, present vaccines and drugs inefficient. So those are the three possible scenarios uh, and very likely we'll find ourselves in the second scenario. Just to summarize what people think uh, about making vaccines, and here you see one quote published in Science by Seth Berkeley uh, from uh, uh, Gavi. Basically says the COVID-19 needs a, a Manhattan project to make vaccines. And the other one a quote is from uh, David Sinclair uh, in a book uh, called Lifespan. And basically says, please remember that governments do not make vaccines, but companies do. So I think those are the two things to keep in mind uh, moving forward. Uh, fortunately, the science is moving uh, very fast. Uh, the, I, in my talk, basically I said in 2013, for the first time, we were able to make a vaccine in, uh, to immunize mice in one week. Uh, at that time, we were pioneers. Today, these technologies are so common that every lab in the world can make it. Uh, so we are very lucky that these technologies are very democratic. There are a lot of vaccines, more than 40 vaccines in development. I'm pretty sure we'll get good vaccines in a pretty short period of time and hopefully good uh, monoclonal antibodies and good drugs. And uh, with those things, we should be able to deal with this uh, pandemic. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention.
So thank you very much, Reno. Um, I hope you can all hear me. This is Faith. Uh, thanks a lot. That was really very informative. Um, and my first, there are a number of questions popping up, uh, but you did really well to answer the very first one, which everyone is asking, which is how long is it going to take? Um, and you gave us the real realistic view that we're looking at anything between one and three years. So just to uh, begin uh, with the questions that you're putting in the, in the chat, thanks for those who put up their questions. Um, what's the durability of protection for the vaccines, some of the vaccines that you discussed? Um, and linked to that, um, I think you sort of alluded to it in your last slide, um, reinfections um, and whether you think people can get reinfected um, or whether they will have chronic infections um, with, with uh, this coronavirus from your experience? Uh, so I think the one thing to keep in mind, this is a, a new virus. Uh, I started to learn about it on the beginning of January. Most of the people started to, to learn about on January 7. And so we still know very little about it. So it's somehow premature to provide a definitive answer to some of these questions. Uh, it's true that in, I mean, in three months, we learned so much about this virus. I mean, 20 years ago was going to take a year or two to learn what we learned in, in, in three months, but there's still a lot of questions for which we don't have an answer. So about durability of uh, protection. I think um, it's difficult to talk about that for DNA vaccines because we have no experience. I think it's going to be pretty long, but we don't have the experience. And so is the case for the viral vectors. Very little experience. While I, although I don't know the answer for COVID, but in case of protein-based vaccines with adjuvants, I know that uh, if you have very good response uh, very early on, immune uh, basically there is a very good possibility that immunity is going to last long. About reinfections and chronic infections, um, I have not seen uh, any report or scientifically proven reinfection. So my assumption is that there, is not, there are no reinfections. There are some anecdotal uh, reports I think it's very likely more due to a, a basically a wrong diagnostic than in the meantime than to reinfection. Uh, I've not seen chronic reported of chronic infections. People once they uh, they clear the infection, they seem to be uh, basically free of the virus. So mm -hmm. uh, although it's early, uh, I think so far this is what I believe is happening. Thanks very, Thanks much. very much. The other question that's coming up is about the vaccine treatment um, and what evidence we have for that. For uh, I missed the first part of the question, sir. Um, it's about vaccine enhancement um, and what evidence we have for enhancement that it might undermine the effectiveness of the vaccine. Yeah, it's a, it's a very important question and very hot. Uh, and the, I think the, the reason is that uh, we had, uh, in, in vaccinology, we all know that back in 1967, when we did uh, the first vaccine for RSV was made, the vaccine, instead of uh, basically uh, protecting the children, made the disease much more severe. Mm. Uh, since then, we have been uh, very scared about that, and uh, we are very. Uh, we try to make a lot of uh, animal models. I've been working with many of those. I don't trust any of those, uh, and uh, so the only way is to uh, basically is very difficult because uh, we can do animal models, but a lot of those animal models do uh, react to artifacts. So um, the Disease enhancement usually happens when you have very low affinity antibodies, 
that are not able to neutralize the virus, but they do bind the virus. And then they're through the FC fragment, they're taken up by uh, immune cells and the virus basically, uh, in, they increase, the antibodies increase the effectiveness of, of the virus and you have a bigger bi viral load. <clears throat> Uh, that, at least I believe, is the explanation of what happened with RSV in 1967. Uh, the consequence of that is that the, if you have a very good neutralizing antibodies with a pre-fusion form of the spike, uh, basically <clears throat> the virus will never multiply and uh, you should avoid basically disease enhancement. However, is a, I mean, whatever you do, you take a risk. So basically we need to be very careful, try to use in vitro and in vivo model and try <clears throat> models before you go into, into clinical trials. Um, I have a question here from Africa. It's someone asking how we can help Africa to set up Not really fair uh, for you, but you might have some thoughts on that. Uh, I, I missed the first part of the question, sorry. Yeah, I said uh, I have a question here from someone in Africa saying how can we help with the testing because the underreporting, uh, what we see now may simply be underreporting um, and what could we do to help? Well, that's a question everywhere, not only for, for Africa, there is not enough tests. Unfortunately, the only uh, te reliable test that we have is PCR from swabs. And, and uh, everywhere we don't have enough. So uh, I don't know how to answer that. Obviously, I mean, now I think uh, tests will be scaled up uh, and uh, will become more and more available. But it's clear, clearly there is underreported everywhere. And, and <clears throat> Because so far we only know the number that we test. We don't know the, uh, how many people are infected that we don't test. True. Um, I have another question here about um, a T cell epitope based vaccine. Um, have you any experience with these types of vaccines? Uh, <clears throat> yes, uh, they are not my favorite vaccines because uh, pure. T cell vaccines, uh, well, first of all, there is not one licensed vaccine that is based on T cells, um, based purely on T cell epitopes. Uh, we, at the times of HIV, we wanted to make a, a, a vaccine based on T, pure T cell epitopes, didn't work. Uh, and so basically, I have no experience other than papers in mice that show that. Uh, mm -hmm. T-cell-based vaccines work, while there's plenty of experience that protein-based vaccines inducing neutralizing antibodies, they do mm -hmm. work. So mm -hmm. I don't want to discourage people, but if I had to choose, I, I will go with protein-based. With, with, Thank yeah, you. With B-cell yeah. epitope. Yeah. Okay. Um, just on that note, we also had a question about the conformation of proteins. So, for example, you talked about the S protein. Um, yeah. and how people can work to get the conformation right, um, because that would lead to a better vaccine. Well, absolutely. The, the conformation of the protein uh, is extremely important. In, in the case of RSV, uh, the conformation, the pre-fusion is an excellent vaccine. The post-fusion is not a good vaccine. We don't have enough information how important is the conformation uh, for vaccine efficacy for COVID. But uh, obviously, uh, if I would say that uh, we should make only vaccines or preferentially vaccines that are based on the pre-fusion conformation. Uh, the pre-fusion conformation uh, is, I think, Barney Graham at the NIH is the one uh, with uh, Jason McLellan have been already published the pre-fusion conformation. And that's the one we should use. Uh, the because it's the one that induces the best neutralizing antibodies. Okay, um, and is there any any evidence or basis for cross protection using um, other SARS MERS vaccines? Any cross protection with COVID nineteen possibly? 
So early reports uh, say that there is no cross protection, or at least no huge cross protection, not enough to uh, basically guarantee protection. Uh, that's true for people start, uh, starting to use monoclonal antibodies and for vaccine, sera from vaccines against uh, SARS and Ebola that don't, rec sorry, against SARS or MERS that do not recognize well enough uh, COVID. Um, I think uh, since they do bind the same receptors as SARS, uh, mm. there are clearly regions which are in common, they have the same conformation. Uh, but I would say for the moment, the vaccines have been developed, uh, they seem to be specific. But I'm pretty sure that in the future, once we know mm. uh, the structure uh, of the binding site uh, and we can find epitopes which are in common, and in the future, probably we should try to design uh, pan-coronavirus vaccines. I think that's doable, but will require time. Uh, and so in the meantime, uh, the first vaccines are just vaccines specific for COVID. Okay, um, there's one comment here that, um, that uh, there's been one report in JCI Insight where the um, anti-spike IgG was shown to cause lung injury. Um, and in this, the S protein had been expressed using the MVA vector. Um, and so the question is, um, how confident you are that the S protein is a good vac vaccine target? Well, uh, the, for SARS and MERS, we know that the uh, S protein is the one uh, against which you have neutralizing antibodies. So if you want to neutralize the, uh, the virus and make sure the virus doesn't multiply uh, and doesn't cause disease, uh, S protein is, is the, for sure is, good, is a good target. I, don't, I haven't seen that paper you mentioned. I, I don't know how they did it, but. Yeah. No, I haven't, I, um, I haven't seen that paper either. So I won't, I won't push the question any, any further. Um, uh, thanks a lot. There's one final one, which is about reports in the press about BCG um, possibly acting as a vac an adjuvant. Uh, do you want to comment perhaps on adjuvants in general? Well, I think I would, the, my understanding of BCG is not uh, as an adjuvant or maybe it's a different, in, not in an adjuvant the way we like to talk, think about. Adjuvants are those substances where you add to a vaccine to get a, a better immune response, to enhance immune response. I think mm. BCG is being used or being proposed, and there is a trial in Australia, I think is starting or ongoing already, where they want to uh, vaccinate with BCG uh, and follow up uh, the, the people and see whether they get uh, a milder disease or they're protected from, from infection or disease. The reason for that is BCG is a very strong uh, immunopotentiator. And basically uh, the idea is that induces a, a trained immunity and that immunity will protect not only against uh, 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 TB, but also will protect against other uh, infections. There have been reports about it's going to protect from other uh, uh, other uh, viral diseases and so on. So will, mm -hmm. BCG will induce a non-specific trained immunity that will basically give broad protection uh, and in particular may skew the immune response to a Th1 immune response that probably will uh, provide broad protection. So uh, it's a very interesting hypothesis, yeah. uh, and we have to see. I mean, uh, it's interesting because there are also countries that use BCG uh, for vaccination of infants and others that don't. So a, a good looking at the severity of the disease in this country could give us an idea mm -hmm. whether the hypothesis is correct or not. Okay, thank you very much. I think this uh, brings us to an end of our question and answer time. We want to thank you all for joining and a special thanks really to Reno for um, giving us that um, very stimulating seminar. Um, we really enjoyed it. Thank you so much.
Uh, thank you to all our participants who joined. Um, look forward to the next um, webinar that we will have. Check for updates on the IUIS website and we'll share these as soon as, the, as, soon as we're organized enough. So thank you very much, Reno. Thanks to everybody and see you next time. Thank you. Thank you, Faith. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye.